My name is Mario Cruz. I'm at Mario Cruz. If you want to uh, follow me on Twitter or get a hold of me. I am the co-founder and CTO of Choose Digital, um, a company that's uh, recently acquired by Viggo. So I'll just give you a quick background on my career. So whatever I say, you could understand that I've done it all. Um, I started in, as a network engineer, lots of certifications, CCIE, a whole bunch of stuff. Then I got into development, did all development for years. Then I got into IT operations, which is a mix of both of those. And then I got into security and then DevOps. And so I have a lot of experience on hacking, networking, DevOps, but now I'm the pointy hair boss. Okay? So I, now I have sort of the experience on all three sides. Uh, what Choose Digital does is basically, we're just basically a white label iTunes store. And we do basically that kind of store for a whole bunch of third party brands. So if you're on United or Viggle or Sky Mall or Marriott and you're buying music or movies or books, we're the back end that does that. We're a pure B2B, we have no real brand. Our brands are gonna be uh, Viggle or United, things like that. The solution looks like this. It's basically what you would expect to see at a media store. Um, for those that know me pretty well, I am a huge fanboy of Cloudbees. Um, I've been using Jenkins probably since it became Jenkins, uh, right when it became Jenkins. Um, I have a lot of friends at Cloudbees, so um, I do get some support sometimes on really cool things, and I usually get on the feature request list. Um, so Sasha and Andre are pretty good friends. Um, so one of the things that would, I want to discuss today and get into the meat of stuff is build, test, and deploy. Um, and so it becomes very important to understand that this is an awesome thing to have, but it's not easy. I mean, there is no free lunch. And I wanted to just discuss a few things as we go today about what it really takes to make that happen. And the sooner you make this happen, all the benefits you're gonna get around innovation. Um, what we do today at our, at, at our shop is basically any push to a stage of product branch creates a build immediately and gets pushed out immediately. So the way it works today is any commit to stage or prod, automatic gets a build and automatic gets, gets pushed to stage. There's a 45 minute delay and automatic gets pushed to production constantly, okay? Um, I will tell you the biggest secret of continuous dev is writing tests. Uh, tests are your friends. Um, your deploys and your builds should spend more time on tests than anything else. And that's integration testing, that's application testing, that's as many things as you can put in that test. Uh, when all tests are passed, it's deployed, it's really that simple. The developer goes out to live site, um, we do a few other things around communication I'll get to, but basically that's our, our process. And so, the sooner you get to this repeatable automation, the sooner you get to the why this is important, right? So, I think everything I just told you, you, you guys have heard a million times, so I don't wanna spend a lot of time on that because that's basically why you're going to the CI tool, that's why you're going to continuous delivery, that's why you're doing these kind of things because this is where you're gonna get the benefit. One of the things about automating all this stuff is so you have time to do what's important, right? You can automate builds and pipelines and integration and your network infrastructure. The sooner you do that, the sooner, right, you get back the time to actually innovate on your product and innovate on your, on your code, right? And actually get away from the stuff that sucks, right? Some of this stuff sucks. The sooner you can make it stop sucking, the sooner you can do things that are important, right? And so I'm a real big advocate for dev and ops to become um, basically people that contribute to the company, right? So I want my developers creating money for the company and value, right? And so what happens there is if a developer is worried about how to move a war file in batch files or zip files or FTPs, you'll never get, you'll never get out of that thing. You're stuck in this whole technical debt piece that if you read you know, the Phoenix Project, you're stuck in that technical debt piece, you'll never get out of it. So you can't innovate if you're constantly worried about, I can't even take a vacation. So one of the things we do um, is we actually allow a lot of flexibility on developer control. So this becomes a very important part in our process at our company. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just talk about two companies here, but my previous company, we spent 
Um, because when I started Choose Digital, it was basically a greenfield, so it's easy to start from scratch. But I had spent two and a half years taking a company with um, no CI, uh, getting Maven deploys and FTPing them and copying and writing batch files to thousands and thousands of servers. And so I spent two years implementing this. Um, and it wasn't very easy. So people ask, but you know, it's, it's why I do it? Why, you know, how do we do this? The best way I tell folks to do it is to just pick off the first project. And don't pick the most important project in your company. Don't pick the, don't, well, I, I, don't, don't pick the money app is what I usually say. Don't start with the money app. The money app is how you get people to really get re respect. But you start on the smaller things. And one of the things we, we talk about is, is decoupling. A lot of things we do today is decouple these monolithic apps. So I had two things we did at the same time. So we moved fr from prem to cloud, and we moved from not continuous deployment, not continuous delivery, not DevOps to, to all that one shot. So what we talked about is having the developers look at the piece of code, look at the things we wanted to do, and then sort of decouple them into these stateless sort of working services. You know, Everybody talks about microservices. I hate the word microservices because none of, them, none of my services are micro, right? We have about 80 running apps and none of them are really micro. But they're micro in the sense that 80 of those apps are running together at one time in their lifetime, right? So we decoupled those pieces. But by doing that, over time, you get to work on your pipeline for those apps pipelines for those products, and pipelines for how that becomes repeatable. So you're not worried about that piece anymore. This creates trust, right? So what we do is, if you want to be part of the team and you want to be a contributor, we're going to trust you, right? And we're going to treat you like an adult. Uh, we don't hire smart people to put them in a box and tell them what to do then you're not getting smart people. You're, you're actually taking smart people and, and, and sort of crushing their soul, <laughs> OK? And how, how many people here have a job where they basically have a box they sit in all day and they have to do the same thing over and over because they're stuck in that piece of, of stuff? See, only one guy said that? Oh, man, you guys are all doing good then. <laughs> so what we do, uh, so what we've done in the last year and a half is we moved away from actually writing specs for applications. Uh, and so what happens is the product team has two choices to come to the developer. They actually either write a story, the story progress of what the functionality is, or they write the press release. This is, I didn't invent this, I stole it from Amazon, that's the Amazon internal piece. And so what they do is, do you show up with a one page press release of what this functionality is gonna do, or you show up with a user story, what this functionality is gonna do. And the developer actually sits there and figures out what he's gonna create and how he's gonna create the product. So it isn't, here's, here's what I want, Here's a deadline, go make it happen, because then I'm just, again, you're just throwing Legos together and hope for the best, right? Um, with a plan, um, that allows the developer to have freedom, and it allows the developer to actually have his input and experience into the product. Most developers, right, probably in this room, or most ops, probably know your business rules better than the product team, better than the sales team, right? You live with all those business rules day after day, and you've seen all iterations of it over the years. So why put that somewhere else? We put that back on the developer. Right? And so the developer has basically time to do that and get that done. It doesn't always work, right? So this is where the second part of this thing is, is the blameless culture. Um, the reason dev and ops and marketing don't get along is because it's always somebody's fault, right? Um, in the old days, it was the network engineers, it was a database, it was the application, um, it was a whole bunch of things. Nobody, it, was, it was nobody's fault at all. But what we've done is, when it, things break, it's everybody's fault, right? So if you're in the break part, it's everybody's fault. And so what that allows you to do is, there is no finger pointing, because I don't care who you point the finger to, everybody's gonna, everybody show up to this meeting, everybody's gonna be woken up in the middle of the night, everybody's gonna lose their vacation time. The other big thing you do is we communicate consistently. So I just told you that we do hundreds and hundreds of builds every day. Um, how many people here are using like HipChat or uh, Slack or another communication tool? Okay, so in Jenkins today, there are plugins that support your builds. So I get a lot of questions on, well, how do I find this piece or how do I find that piece or what's the URL? Um, we do a lot of builds and people ask, what's the URL for that build? With the HipChat communications, I drop in that the, that the build started 
when the build finish, you can click on a, it's off to the right screen, but you can click on the URL of where that actually is running right now for stage, right? And so by using HipChat, if you're talking to your developers or you're talking to your QA or QE team, um, if you, you know, we're not, a, we're not an office that has everybody in it. We have people in Miami, New York, Seattle, San Francisco. So it becomes even more difficult, right? And I hate emails, right? So and especially if you're doing a lot of builds, you don't want to spend the day at the, at the Jenkins user conference, go back and have 10,000 emails of builds and fails or builds and success. That's just going to be, that's just noise, so you're never going to see it. What we do is we put it in specific rooms for each app of those 80 apps. And so I can go into a room and see all the builds for today, if there's successes, if there's any issues, right? You can capture that at all times and communicate at all times. And so as that starts happening early on in this, in this progress, and this procedure, you get to understand really what your build cycle is. Um, we actually, you can see the build times in there because you'll see the start and the stop. Um, I mean, if you can see right here, it says started and success. You'll see how much time it ran, six minutes, 12 minutes. Right, so you'll see all that information. And if you see builds growing and growing and becoming, becoming out of control, here's a place you can see it right there because in HipChat and Slack you have that history, right? Um, and so the other thing is to capture as much information as you can. The other thing we do is we have, uh, this is actually another uh, pl uh, Jenkins plugin. Um, we put what we think are the top, top things that we need and we make sure that everybody can see where they are, okay? So what we've done is these are basically our top uh, internal apps that constantly have to be uh, running. And I, I broke one on purpose so you guys can see that when it breaks, it tells you who the possible uh, person that broke it, right? And that's not to shame them. It's just so that people understand that that's who's working on it now because they got the same thing. So by doing this and communicating this, there isn't an issue of where are we, what's the problem, right? The more you, the more, so most people try to manage up, right? So whatever tools we create ma manages up, and we manage down, we manage sideways. So it's the same tools for everybody, for my dev, for my ops, for my boss, right? For the, the guys in product. And so if you're in a company like us where we have about half of our customers are API customers and half of our customers are what we call white label that we run them. So our, for us, our stage apps and are in delivery are very important to us because somebody's developing against that externally to us, right? So I want to make sure that those are always, those builds are correct and they're always running and what's happening there. So these are things that you get to pick whatever you want. And this is a, this app is pretty cool. It lets you put 100, 1,000, whatever. You want to get a vertical monitor and do it. Um, it's, it's basically out there, okay? And I think the, this is my sort of slide to you guys, it, you know, you guys can change the culture of a company. And one of the biggest things in the culture of companies is no matter how strategic your boss is, right, culture eats strategy every day, all day long. You guys can't let that happen. So what I tell folks is you guys, right, are the chefs of this world. So right, so if, it's, if, if software is eating culture, you guys are the chefs. You guys can change this, right? So I, I, I always hear pushback, but my boss doesn't want to do it or Product doesn't understand this, and this is going to take time. If you explain to them what the benefits are early on, right, and how we're going to measure those, right? So everything I just showed you is communication and measurement and understanding. So the more you get that piece of information out front, the better this is going to be for all you guys. So what happens in these cases, right, is that's how you build this organization, right? If you communicate this way, Communications comes down this way. If you communicate left to right, communications comes down left to right, okay? Um, the way your organization communicates is usually how your application is run. I will tell you that's, uh, that's basically, uh, uh, you know, pretty, pretty much statistical that that's how it happens. Something we, that I, I will tell you guys to do. Um, we are a huge Jenkins shop and I don't run my Jenkins. I have CloudBees run my Jenkins, right? So CloudBees, I have enterprise cloud, uh, Jenkins with CloudBees. But this is, I will tell you, this is my biggest point here. I would tell you that at my company, there are very few things that I want to do, right? So if it is not core to my business and core to my innovation, I don't do it all, at all, right? So I'm going to show you a slide of what we don't do. If it's, if it's not making me money or it's not letting me innovate, I don't want to do it. 
I'm never going to be smarter than KK on Jenkins. Why, why do I want to run my own Jenkins, right? I'm never going to have an infrastructure like Amazon. Why do I want to have that infrastructure, okay? So what we've done is we've moved, we, we see CloudBees for, for us as a differentiator, right? Because it allows me not to worry about Jenkins and plugins. You know, I use it. If it breaks, I open a ticket, you know? I, I, it's really that simple. I mean, I'm not here to plug CloudBees, but I'm going to, that's how we use it. Um, the same is true for AWS and these are things that I don't do, right? Asana, HipChat, Trello, Sandesk, SandGrid, New Relic, Paper Trails. If it's not in my core business, I'm not doing any of it because I'll never become an expert, okay? This is very true also like of search. I'll just tell you. Um, we spent the first few years of my company of Choose Digital writing search and I probably, I, I probably had a million hours in search. When Amazon came out with cloud search, right, we looked at the scalability of cloud search and, and I said, I'm never gonna be the expert that Amazon's gonna be in cloud search, right? And so we rewrote our application in six months and, and actually ditched everything we had written. Because the IP isn't in how cloud search works, the IP is how my search algorithm works. The IP we have is how we rank things. The IP we have is how we actually import that information, right? The IP of your company is what you make money on, not your infrastructure. In the 80s and 90s, infrastructure was important. That, that was a different, differentiator, right? But it isn't today. That's just a way to not keep your eye on the ball, right? And so the sooner you guys all in this room think about how the bottom line works and how to make money for your company, the more you get listened to, right? So this is always a tough thing because, listen, the company I came before, we had PCI, we had financials, I did millions and millions of credit card transactions a day. And everybody said, you can't go to the cloud. You can go to the cloud, right? And there's things you can do to sort of fix the issues that you come up with. Um, before I ever met Sasha, um, we, 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 we were actually at a conference, and Sasha had this great quote that I, I, I steal all the time, which is, you know, your best practice might not be that good. Yeah? You know, that's the best quote you know, I've ever heard. It's like, what your best practice is aren't going to be better than Amazon's best practice. Right? They're not going to be better than CloudBee's best practice on Jenkins. They're not going to be better than, you know, HipChat's best practice on communication. Right? If that's not core to your business, it shouldn't be core to you. For every dollar you spend running one of these things is a dollar you're not spending on making money for your company. The next most important thing I, is I say log everything. Um, you know, this is four days into a month, five days into a month. Uh, I made this slide. We had 23 million events, log everything. Because what happens is, you know, this is, this is another truth you guys know. There's two people that make decisions in a room, right? The guy with the highest title or salary or the guy with the data. The only, beat, the only way to beat the guy with the highest salary and the title is with the data, okay? Period. So when you walk in and your boss says, is it my gut feeling or I wanna do this or marketing says that? If you have no data, you have to do what they say. Right? And sometimes we do it because we do it to capture the data. Right? That's what, that's what continuous development gives you. And that's where the innovation comes in. You can add things you know, quickly and put it out there and test it and get the information, get the data. Right? And you know what? I'm wrong sometimes and sometimes I'm right. But the data is going to tell you who that is. Right? Not who is the guy with the highest title salary. And then the other most important thing is to monitor your apps. Um, I am also a huge proponent of New Relic. I know that there's Atmon and a whole bunch of other things out there. It's really, there isn't a better one or a worse one. I would just say it's whatever your people like to use, right? I use New Relic because my team already had uh, lots of experience with New Relic. It wasn't like they're better or worse, it's just my team had experience. And so, um, you know, we get this question, what tools should I use for CI? What tools should I use for logging? What tools? I mean, really, in the top tiers now, they're all pretty much the same. It's going to be what your team is more comfortable with. It's going to be what your team has experiences. It's going to be what your team has friends that are doing, right? Because there's a community of people out there. Um, how many people here go to meetups, go to meetups and go to things? So if you're in a meetup for New Relic, you probably want to go to New Relic. If you're in a meetup for Atmon, you want to go, you know, so whatever your meetups are using is basically what I told people to go with, right? And, uh, you know, and sometimes I would say innovation, by definition, is not doing what other people are doing. Sometimes you want to do the opposite, because maybe there's something there 
that you know that nobody else knows, right? So there isn't a right way or a wrong way. It's what your people, right, and the practice of your team is, wants to do. That's the important piece in all this. Because that's what allows you to become more, um, you know, elastic on that piece, right? And this is also the most important piece of our company. If you push code, you're on call, just like DevOps, okay? How many people in this room have taken a two-week vacation this year? How many people in this room want to take a two-week vacation this year? Okay, so you know how you get a whole bunch of developers and ops to sort of buy in, right? I tell them, I force my whole team to take two weeks vacation every year, right? And so how, do you, how does that happen? If you write code in my company, you're on call. If you want to take your two-week vacation, write better test. <laughs> it's that simple. Because how many people here have a code freeze in December for the, for the holidays? OK, so f five years ago, I would say, of course, we don't do that today because if the week before Thanksgiving or the week before Christmas, I can make an extra 2% because I can change where an icon is or a button is or the user flow or the story, I do it in a heartbeat because that's revenue to the bottom line. To say, I'm going to wait after Christmas to fix that, th that's money you, you, don't get, you don't get that money back, right? And so this is the same thing as the two-week vacation. By, by telling your management, this, this is what we'll do and this is how we do it, OK? Um, one of the biggest, you know, how many people do less than six releases a year in this room? Less than six, year, six releases? Okay. The problem with big bang releases, right? This is also, you know, this, I have a whole slide on this, but I, I didn't put it in the stack. The problem with big bang releases and people's sort of perception of that is that it's usually tested and it's, it has a lot of things, but it's so monolithic that when it goes wrong, right, you have to do so much backtracking that your next release is already in jeopardy a day into that release. You, you've, you've already, that next release is gone because now you're gonna spend all your time working on the fix of this release. While continuous dev lets you switch back yesterday, we could go back one, we could go forward one, and it becomes very important to capture that, right, in those conversations. Because everybody loves these big bang releases thinking they're less risky. They're not. They're 100%, 1,000% more risky than daily deliveries. Because, if, I mean, you know, again, we're gonna make mistakes, right? I, this is not a panacea where everything always runs perfectly, right? But I can go back to what I just did yesterday. I can go back to what I had an hour ago, okay? The other big thing for us is feature flags. This is probably the most important thing I've learned in the last five years. Because what happens with big clients and what happens with the rest of your team, and if you're doing a lot of mobile app support, your product will be available before the mobile app is, before Apple approves it. So how do you push daily without that happening, right? Is we put in feature flags. I'm going to show you what some of ours look like. Um, and the framework we're using is uh, the RKS out of the Netflix OSS. Does anybody know that, Netflix OSS stuff? OK. So with the RKS flag, we actually can push constantly and then turn the feature on and off in production when we want to, right? So we just talked about somebody pushed something to stage and went to production, right? That feature might be turned off. And we might turn on that feature like at 4 in the morning, or 3 in the morning, or 1 in the morning, depending on what we want to do. And we can test some features and receive that data we talked about by doing that piece. So if you, the, the, the Arceus framework is pretty, uh, is pretty powerful. Um, we've been doing this now from the core of my team has been together like six, six years. And so it's, it's pretty powerful. What that lets you do is so back to log everything. Usually some people ask me, how many feature flags do you usually have? We probably average about 38 feature flags. Um, if you're more than 38, we tell people, go remove stuff we're not using, right? But a third of that, if you look at it, is purely on monitoring, right? If I want to log everything, there's a flag for that. I want to log what's coming back from the console, there's a flag for that, right? So those are the things that we want to turn on when we want to capture certain data on certain things. I, I don't want that data every day because that just becomes noise. So a third of those feature flags are basically just on run logging. But some of them are just feature sets. Some of our clients don't want music. Some of them don't want TV. Some of them don't want books. It's the same code base. I'm not doing anything different, right? I'm just turning the feature on and off. Um, so back to the pipeline. Some, somebody asked me uh, last week on this question on, uh, uh, on Jenkins. And so we only have one pipeline for each product, right? And basically, the branch tells it w where it's going to go, right? So if the branch is production, it goes to production. If the branch is stage, it goes to stage. But the, but the build pipeline is one pipeline. I don't have two different Jenkins. I don't have two different pipelines. Everything is identical for everything we do, right? 
The only thing that changes is where the branch comes from. So I just wanted to put this up there so we can talk about this a little bit. And I'm gonna try to go a little quickly so we can have some time for questions. But anytime a developer pushes to, to, to GitHub, it automatically generates the, the build. Um, and on Clobbies, Clobbies fires off. We have all our build tests, all our unit tests, our code analysis, all our validation for testing, basically all our integration testing. We package and deploy. And you see that little arrow? That arrow always goes out no matter what. If it's successful or not successful, everybody gets an email, which I hate, but now we use HipChat or Slack, you put it in there. Then what happens is it automatically gets de deployed to stage, automatically gets deployed to production. And then the little flags under the auto mean feature flags. Those could be on or off depending on how you set it up on that, on that build. We do still have some manual stuff we do um, because we're tied to a third party client and sometimes they have rules that we can't break. So they're not continuous, so we're not continuous on those. But I would say it's only one, one of our clients. Um, something I want to get to also is we basically go around and that deploy for us now happens pretty quickly to Docker. And then from Docker goes right out to um, Elastic Beanstalk. And basically it runs on Elastic Beanstalk and basically then based on performance metrics, we actually can scale that out automatically, right? So the moment somebody pushes this, it's, it basically all happens. There's no manual intervention, there's no provisioning machines, no, no provisioning anything. It's basically a Docker image that gets pushed out to S3, Elastic Beanstalk opens it up, uh, does a non-downtime uh, push, so basically it deploys your app, right? It drains down this app, it switches the EOB to the new app, you're up and running, no downtime. Thank you guys, if you guys wanna come up to me, uh, guys ask the questions, I have t-shirts for anybody that came and asked me questions. I have about seven, so thank you.